Here we are uh, continuing with our Mark commentary. This would be session 18. We're going to do the um, healing, or I call it the restoration of the paralytic in Mark chapter 2. I've uh, put the letter very small so that um, the whole passage can be seen. Uh, it might be too small uh, to see on YouTube, but um, I can see it pretty well from here, and I hope uh, with an enlarged screen you can do so too. So we have a, a scene here where he goes back to Capernaum uh, after some days, and it was reported he was at home, it says here, so that this is his home in Capernaum, and we mentioned the uh, article in Anchor Bible Dictionary on Capernaum, where it discusses the a house that traditionally has been considered Peter's house and the excavations and graffiti and other things that archaeologists like to uh, examine uh, make a good case that this is Peter's house. It's a nice house, waterfront house near the synagogue. And uh, if you read the article and, and I you know, my in my studies, they, they explained it to us, how these were Roman streets laid out in a certain way. We don't get too much into these details here. We're more focused on the, um, the uh, theological and literary composition of the gospel as God's way of communicating uh, his revelation, which is spiritual in, in, in a human artistic way. We covered all that in, in prior sessions. And so that this scene of so many people gathered at the door and there not being any room is, is something that can be visualized uh, with the archaeological studies. And he was preaching the word to them, it says here. Um, and uh, there came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And uh, they could not get near him because of the crowd, so they removed the roof above him. I would assume that's a thatched type roof. They remo easily removed uh, uh, the kind of covering these roofs had. There was probably an atrium in the center. I think these were houses that had various either families or units around a courtyard, as I recall. And uh, when they made an opening, they lay, let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, and it might include the paralytic or, or not, he said, Son, your sins are uh, forgiven. And so uh, let's pause there a second. Uh, the first thing that Jesus says to this man uh, has to do with his sins. Uh, and in Mark, this faith is important. Uh, there's going to be a passage, a passage, I think, in chapter 3 where he could do no miracle there. Maybe it's chapter 6 because of their lack. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So it goes to the extent of saying Jesus was unable to do a miracle because of their um, lack of faith. Um, and so um, I, I've seen... Uh, links between this episode and uh, an episode in the Gospel of John. And I do think that John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel, tends to take events narrated in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Mark and Luke, and maybe aggrandize them. I know I'm stepping on a limb here, but he certainly fleshes out and stylizes and maximizes uh, things that Jesus does in the synoptics. He gives longer speeches, just start with that one. <laughs> in the other Gospels, he doesn't give these super long speeches. And instead of a, a, a man being on his way to burial or a daughter that just died and maybe sleeping or not, he has Lazarus with four days. And what he has in chapter 5 of uh, his gospel, John, has a paralytic who has been lying there for 38 years, which is an incredibly uh, long time. He says, everybody always beats me, which I called a lame excuse. And um, 
And Jesus asks him, do you want to be healed? And he gives, you know, his lame excuse. And Jesus says, I'll get up, take your uh, bed and walk. And the man immediately walked. And so you have uh, an extreme episode, if you will, of, um, you know, this kind of thing. But what I'm interested in in, in John is the 38 years. The 38 years, to me, uh, should be linked to Deuteronomy uh, 2.14, um, which is uh, the length of time that Israel is said to have basically been, been going around a mountain, wasting time in the desert. If you look at Deuteronomy, uh, the length of time to go from the holy mountain of Sinai to the holy mountain of Kadesh Barnea, which is really already the mountain of the Amorites, which is the goal of the exodus to the promised land, that's an 11-day journey according to the first verses of Deuteronomy. So I, I, I draw the parallel between a journey that should have taken 11 days had there not been rebellion and reluctance to believe in Yahweh and to take the land and to accept his salvation, even though going through the desert. And um, the 38 years, which uh, is mentioned again, as I said, in Deuteronomy 2.14. And I think that is sort of a background to this episode in John and I'll return to it just briefly in a second because of other parallels, and that's the only reason I'm dragging in John to a discussion of Mark. So that Jesus uh, forgives the, th this man's uh, sins, and um, immediately you have uh, the scribes, it says in most translations, questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Uh, and so you have this, uh, you know, taking uh, you know, umbrage against what Jesus has done. I have uh, made a chart, which I, I will put at some point, of correspondences in the Gospel of Mark. This very expression, uh, it says here, questioning in their hearts, other, uh, they say, thinking in their hearts. But if you looked at the Greek, I'm going to put my little uh, you know, mouse over it. They were in, in literally dialoguing in their heart, discussing. Dialogos is a word back and forth. This same exact expression or verb is going to be used when they question Jesus after the temple act about which, with what dominion, better than authority, have you done this? And who gave you this uh, dominion or authority? And Jesus then, who's not ready to uh, come clean as to his nature, he'll do that in the trial. I am, yes, I am the Messiah, and you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds at the right hand of the power. That's the confession he gives to the high priest in Mark 14, which results in his condemnation. Um, he, he then, in Mark, uh, he's not ready to say that, so he says, I'm going to ask you a question. You tell me whether John the Baptist's baptism was from heaven or from men. And they uh, start dialoguing among themselves, same verb. Uh, and say, if we say from heaven, he's going to say, why don't you believe us? Why didn't you believe him? And if we say from men, people are going to you know, stone us uh, or, or get incredibly mad at us. And so you have a, an exousia dominion questioning. After the temple act, chapter 11, which results in a questioning of how Jesus has done this and who gave him this dominion to do it, and then resulting in a dialoguing among themselves. So when they ask Jesus, who gave you this, uh, or who can forgive uh, sins but God alone, Jesus says to them, why are you uh, dialoguing in your hearts? He repeats the same verb, and, you know, maybe not a common 
a real common verb. Uh, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say to the rise, take up your bed and walk? So that in Mark and in, in, in generally, uh, sin and illness are related and uh, you know, maybe even psychosomatic, uh, certainly things that you do that are sinful, maybe like drinking or some other type of uh, bad uh, activity can result in uh, detriment to your health, etc. And this paralytic, again, if you see it a little bit in the light of this John's Gospel, is a, a man who, you know, maybe had, was wishy-washy about, you know, uh, his desire to, to, to not sin on the one hand and to then be healthy on the other. And so then this great line uh, comes, but that you may know that the uh, Son of Man uh, ex has exousia, so that you know that exousia in Greek, exousia has the Son of Man to release sins upon the earth. And that uh, in the Greek is quite a mirror of um, the language regarding exousia or dominion in Daniel 7. It's God who gives dominion. Even Jesus and John says, you would have no power over me to Pilate if it had not been given to you from above. And I think that's an exousia word. I, I, I'm going to double check it, but it's the same idea. In Daniel 7, we keep, we've talked about the great son of man, New Adam passage that has dominion over the beast, which has been a dominion that has been taken away from the beasts and given to one like a son of man. Um, that's where Jesus, that's what Jesus is alluding to. And he's using the expression, the son of man has exousia upon the earth. That's another epites gaze is another Greek uh, phrase in the translation of Daniel. Uh, in, in various chapters, I think in chapter four, but you have a whole... Uh, eschatology in Daniel about the kingdom and the little rock that hits that clay foot of the statue which represents all the empires and kingdoms and a little rock like that can can destroy all evil empires and then that grows into a kingdom which is then given to the, the Son of Man and to the saints of the Most High so that um, Jesus then demonstrates his exousia, both to forgive sins, answering their questions. Who gave you this exousia? Well, the Most High gave me that exousia. The, the, again, the submerged subtext of this is Daniel 7. And, um, and so he, he then tells the paralytic, uh, you know, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all, uh, besides themselves, amazed. It's almost like uh, you know being outside of yourself, uh, ecstasy in a way. And uh, they glorified God, saying, uh, "You know, we have never seen anything, anything like this." Uh, and so you know, this is a, the new Adam has just done something which uh, was very unexpected. He's forgiven sins, an invisible act, uh, confirmed or manifested or proven, if you will, by the physical restoration of this uh, paralytic. Um, and to be finishing, uh, if we went back to John 5, you would see that um, he gives another one of his long speeches. But here in John 5, the discussion uh, on healing on the Sabbath continues. And by the way, he tells the paralytic there, go and sin no more, lest something worse happen to you. So that in this guy's case, the sin and the being paralyzed and, and then lying there for so many years and not even doing anything about it are related. Um, the discussion then issues into a discussion as to the Father working still. It's like the Sabbath uh, in Genesis 1, uh, 
is sort of in abeyance or never happened, and, and a new Sabbath is awaited, like the letter to the Hebrew says in chapter 4. But the discussion sort of culminates, uh, at least uh, here, in that um, they were trying to kill him because he not only called God his own father, this translation says, but he made himself equal to God, or, by, or making himself equal to God. And then uh, if you continue with the uh, speech that comes after that, it will say that as the Father has life in himself, he has also given the Son to have life in himself and has given him exousia to judge. This is John 5, 27, because he is the Son of Man. So that you have in primitive Christianity, in the Gospels, even earlier in a way, or at least in the Gospels, you have this real thinking, I think, about this Son of Man. If it isn't Jesus himself, I think Jesus himself is talking like this. Which again reminds me to uh, plug Daniel Boyarin's book again, The Jewish Gospels as saying that the real problematic title for mainstream Judaism uh, when applied to Jesus, or in, when claimed by Jesus, was Son of Man, and, and, and nothing, nothing really else, more than Messiah, more than Son of God. I'm going to stop there, and um, and and thank you for your um, attention.